Hey, Beaster Youth, good to see you. I hope you've had a Merry Christmas and a really happy new year. Uh, I can't believe we're in 2021. Can you believe that? I'm so glad 2020 is over and I'm hopeful and I'm looking forward to better things in 2021. A couple things to remind you, a few quick announcements. Uh, the youth board at the pastors, uh, with the pastor's approval, have said that we can take a step back from meeting in person as a youth ministry um, until after Martin Luther King weekend. So our first in-house won't be until January 24th, and our first youth worship on Sunday night will be January 31st. Uh, we just want to give you guys uh, a few weeks to let let school figure itself out again in the new year. Uh, if there's any major cases or blowups of COVID, that hopefully after the holidays we can uh, let that that calm down a little bit before we're meeting back together in person. Uh, we want you to be safe first and foremost, and trust that this will be uh, the best way that we know how to do that. Uh, we do look forward to seeing you again on the 24th in person. Uh, between now and then, you're going to keep seeing videos. We'll keep put, putting out stuff on YouTube and on Instagram. Uh, you can be sure to look for those there at the appropriate times. Um, we're starting a new series today, and I'm really excited about this series. This is going to be something that we continue um, for years. Um, that January and February, we're going to do an intentional focus on foundations of our faith. Um, for those of you that are in sixth grade, this will serve as your confirmation lessons. Um, for those of you in seventh through twelfth grade, you've already heard a lot of this. We're going to do it in a little different way, and hopefully it's a great refresher for you as you continue your walk with Christ. So as we get into this, this series called Foundations of Faith, um, again, we'll revisit it every year in January and February. Uh, we're going to start today with the focus on the word connection. So that led me, led me to this thought about our church. Have you ever thought about how we came together as a church, as the members of Buncombe Street and the members of Buncombe Street United Methodist Youth Group? Well, we've talked several times over, over my first few years about how important it is that we as Christians, that we, that we live a life of faith, that we, that we don't do it in solitude. We don't do it alone all of the time, that we find ways to, to build community around us, and that we connect with other people that are also living our faith, their faith out. Um, so today we're going to take that a step further to talk about the importance of the structure of the church. And I'm, I'm not talking about the actual structure of the building and the walls and how it's put together, but the bigger picture of how the United Methodist Church works and functions in the world today. Um, Specifically, how our faith plays into the structure of the United Methodist Church. Now, if you think about it, if the church didn't have a structure or a foundation to uphold it, we would likely not be here. If we didn't have the, the rules and the guidelines and the practices set in place for us to, to function well as a church, there would be no building, there'd be no money to pay for salaries of staff, um, there'd be no way for us to do youth group and all the great things that we do. So the structure of the church, both this church specifically and the larger United Methodist Church, it's really important that we have an, at least an understanding of how that fits into our faith and how we fit into the structure of the church, how we get to participate. Um, I also think about schools. Like if, if you were to think about your school, not having any rules or guidelines, no regulations on what's taught, it would be absolute chaos. Nothing would get done. Structure is so important, and that's something that helps us to, to take steps to move forward in, in school, in learning, but also in our faith and in, in, in our collective faith as, as Christians. Um, so we're going to look at a scripture from the Old Testament, the book of Nehemiah, to see how in one Bible story, how structure helped to connect a large number of people to accomplish a task too big for one person or even a small group of people, regardless of how committed they were. Now, I'd encourage you to read Nehemiah chapters two through four. I'm going to do my best to summarize it, um, and then we'll jump into a few of those scriptures um, that, that we'll focus on. So, 
Some background for today's story. Uh, most of the Old Testament focuses on a special community of people described as God's people, um, also known as the Hebrews or the Israelites or the Jews. Um, as you read through the Old Testament, you discover that this special group of people, um, they went through a lot, okay? They were slaves in Egypt. They, they were led out by Moses um, out of slavery. Uh, they formed their own nation, appointing their own king, sometimes with God's help, um, so that their king, um, I'm sorry, so with God's help, but they also uh, couldn't get along. And they didn't always follow God's way. So their kingdom split into a kingdom called Judah and a kingdom called Israel. Now, Israel was defeated by an enemy nation and was never really heard, heard of again. Uh, the kingdom of Judah, however, with Jerusalem at its capital, was defeated by, by the Babylonians and taken into exile as a group. So our story today with Nehemiah picks up after some of those exiles returned to, to Jerusalem and found it in ruins. A man named Nehemiah was inspired to go to Israel and to rebuild the walls of the city, rebuild the walls that protect, protected it from enemies. Um, he knew this would not be an easy task, and the surrounding nations um, didn't want Judah to become a kingdom again, which complicated things. So let's jump into Nehemiah a little bit. Now, Nehemiah, um, hearing that Jerusalem was in ruins, decided that he would go to the king that he was serving, and he would ask for permission to travel to his homeland and to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Um, he prayed, and then he went to speak with the king, and the king granted him permission. And then Nehemiah asked for supplies and support along the way so they could have safe travel, so they had the, the necessary uh, supplies to build the wall back. Um, and what we find is, as he gathered together a small group of people and told them the plan, um, and you see it in, in Nehemiah 2, 18, it says, let us start building. And then later on in that verse, it says, they committed themselves to the common good. So we see this connection. We see something that's supposed to be a really big project that one person or a small group of people can't do on their own. But within the connection, they committed themselves to start building and to doing the common good. Later on in Nehemiah 4, we're going to pick it up in verse 12 through 23. This is as they're, they're beginning the process of rebuilding the walls. And this is what it says. When the Jews who lived near them came, they said to us 10 times, from all the places where they live, they will come up against us. This is the other nations. So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in open places, I stationed people according to their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. After I looked th these things over, I stood up and said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your kin, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that their plot was known to us and God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction and half held the spears, shields, and bows and body armor. And the leaders posted themselves behind the whole house of Judah, who were building the wall. The burden bearers carried their loads in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and with the other held a weapon. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread out, and we are separated far from one another on the wall. Rally to us whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, our God will fight for us. So we labored at the work, and half of them held the spears from break of dawn until the stars came out. And I also said to the people at the time, let every man and his servant pass the night inside Jerusalem so that they may be at guard for us by night and may labor by day. So neither my brothers nor my servants nor the men of the guard who followed me ever took off our clothes. Each kept his weapon in his right hand. Whew, that was a lot. But here we have the story of Nehemiah setting up structure 
setting up all the families, all the people that they had support so that Judah could be rebuilt, so that Judah could rebuild Jerusalem. They stationed them carefully. They built the walls as they needed to. And not only that, they stood guard because they knew that other kingdoms, surrounding kingdoms would want to take, take over and would want to fight them. So they built at the threat of being harmed. They stood their ground. They had structure. They had organization. And they followed through. As it said in, in 2.18, they started building and they committed themselves to the common good. So this is a great, great story. And it's a great example of how we as a church have committed to the common good. As we build churches, as we build the kingdom of God, as we make disciples, we're doing the work of God. We're committing to it, but we have to do it collectively. We have to all pitch in and do our part. And that's where this United Methodist Church and the connection that we have together is so helpful and so beneficial. So I'm, I'm sure you can imagine how difficult it would be to try to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem by yourself um, or with that small group of committed people. It really took Nehemiah um, organizing, setting up structure so that it could happen. Um, so the next question that, that comes to me, comes to mind for me, is so what does this story have to do with us today? What does it have sto- that, this story have to do with me as a youth director? What does it have to do with you as a middle schooler or a high schooler? Well, and more specifically even, how does that have to do with us in the United Methodist Church? Um, specifically, B Street Youth at Buncombe Street United Methodist Church within the bigger picture of the United Methodist Church. Well, in short, I think, and this is what I hope you really connect to on this this uh, devotion. Uh, in short, the larger connectional community that that needs our individual gifts to accomplish something much greater than we, what we can do on our own. Um, we need the structure of the church, the structure that the church provides to be able to come together, offering our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Now, I know you've heard those those phrases before. You hear it almost every time when somebody joins the church. Um, As we, are, as members of the church, fulfill those five things, um, as a member of the United Methodist Church, we need to know how it's structured. So there are seven components that I want to go over of the United Methodist Church. We're going to do this really quickly. And if you have questions, you can always come back and ask me. So the seven things are general conference, annual conference, bishops, districts, local churches, pastors, and the book of disciplines. Now, let me go back through those real quickly and give you just a basic, basic description of what they are and what they do. So general conference is a worldwide governing body of the United Methodist Church. They usually meet every four years, and they're the ones that set um, all of the rules and the guidelines that we as the United Methodist Church should follow. The second one, annual conference. Now, um, annual conference in our case um, would be the state of South Carolina. All of the United Methodist churches within the state of South Carolina form the South Carolina annual conference. They usually meet every every year and they handle a lot of the business of the church. Um, The third thing, bishops. Now, they are the people that lead each annual conference. Districts. Now, within each Um, annual conference, there are districts. We happen to be in the Greenville district, and that's led by a district superintendent. Um, It's kind of like a pastor to all of the pastors. Now, the next thing is the local churches. That's Buncombe Street. That's us. That's where we come into uh, the United Methodist Church, is that we are a local church uh, within the district, the Greenville district of the South Carolina annual conference. Um, And then at each local church, you have in some cases, a pastor, or in our case, several pastors that are, that are chosen um, to help lead this local congregation. And then the last thing, the Book of Discipline. This is the set of guidelines and rules that every UM church uh, is there to follow, or that's supposed to follow, um, so that we collectively work together for the same vision, the same outcome, um, hoping to, to, to reach the same goals. And that's really to make disciples um, for Christ. Um, To bring it all full circle, 
any changes that are made to the Book of Discipline have to happen at general conference. That happens every four years. Now, that's a very quick description of seven huge pieces of the United Methodist Church. Um, but having a basic understanding of those seven things will help you understand where you fit and how this church functions. Um, in closing, our, our faith both as a church and as individuals is supported and encouraged by the connection to other United Methodist churches. Um, pastors are trained by United Methodist seminaries, um, those seminaries and some United Methodist colleges like Wofford um, over in Spartanburg are in part funded by the United Methodist Church. If the United Methodist Church wasn't structured in this way, there wouldn't be a South Carolina basketball tournament, Methodist basketball tournament every year that I know all of you love. Um, as our, so as our youth ministry continues to move forward, my greatest and most heartfelt prayer is that you feel that B Street Youth is a place where you belong and a place that you can connect with both God and other people in genuine and meaningful ways. If you haven't felt that yet, don't hesitate to come and talk to me. Um, come and talk to Cody. Come and talk to one of our pastors. We'd love to help you find your place here at Buncombe Street, here in the Connectional United Methodist Church.